our flag high, sky high, embrace the pride in our heart. ASEAN, we are born as one, looking out to the world. For peace, our goal from the very start, and prosperity to the Okay guys, uh, welcome to another podcast episode by DJ Anesh. If your eardrums haven't burst by now, uh, thank God for that and I welcome you to this podcast. Over the next course of the 40 minutes or so, uh, I'll be entertaining you with my soothing voice. Those deep husky tones, rich with manliness and suave and charm. Well guys, I hope to deliver some form of entertainment and enjoyment in this uh, podcast as well as, uh, you know, education. You know, that's always important. But no, just focus on my voice. Focus on my voice. Let it ease you into this really enjoyable and meaningful topic on ASEAN. Let us, as Southeast Asians, find our identity. Let us embrace the spirit that envelops this region. And let us learn more about the organization that binds us all together. Last time round, we t- took a look at how the organization began, the motivations surrounding its formation. We looked at four different forces. We looked at decal, the Cold War, interstate tensions, and national priorities and motivations in leading and influencing the formation of ASEAN. So today, since ASEAN has already been established, that's where we at. We are at at the juncture in our study. We are be, we'll be looking at the first decade of ASEAN and especially to do with their regional security. Now that the organization is formed, how exactly did it function? Did it function well? Were there things being done? Was ASEAN everything that it said it would be? What were the challenges that it faced and what were the opportunities that it gleaned from these challenges? So as we enter this decade, ASEAN's first decade, its foundational decade, Let's take a look at the tempest that surrounds ASEAN and see if ASEAN was able to overcome it. My name is DJ Anesh. Welcome to this podcast on regional security in ASEAN's first decade, 1967 to 1976. Okay, guys, uh, hopefully that you, you have enjoyed the uh, dramatics uh, for the intro. I always like to do creative intros. Uh, at least it, it, it starts off high because honestly everything goes downhill from here. My monotonous voice will see you through uh, this podcast and uh, I wouldn't blame you if you, if you hit the stop button now. I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, I would too. But if you do continue, kudos to you and uh, thank you for Continuing to listen to me, all you five subscribers out there, love you guys, send my love to you all. Now, today we'll be talking about ASEAN. Uh, last time around, we talked about the motivations related to its formation. And now, um, I want to talk about, now since it's established already in 1967, August 8, uh, I want to look at the first decade. And specifically, I want to look at um, its management of regional security. Uh, why regional security, number one, it's one of the big uh, purviews that ASEAN has over the region. When ASEAN is formed, regional security is one of the big things that concerns the five founding members. 
So regional security is a big thing. We've, we've covered a bit of this already with the IST conflicts and the Vietnam War and all that. Um, but today I'll go into greater detail with all of these things. Um, also, uh, why, why regional security and you know, a whole lecture based on this in this decade? Uh, I also want to look at the startings, the, the beginnings of ASEAN. Because honestly, you, it is one thing to be established, but it is another thing to have all your structures and your mechanisms that allow you to function effectively. Now, in the first decade, it's the beginning decade of ASEAN, and unfortunately, many of these mechanisms weren't set in place. So I want to draw a distinction between the establishment of something versus its functionality as well as its effectiveness. So the, the, the hypothesis for SPQ questions surrounding ASEAN's management of regional security, a lot of it would concern over its role and its function, and crucially about its effectiveness. So that's the focus of, of what we're going through today, uh, the role and the function, some of its methods, and its effectiveness. So that's the switch of our focus. Previously, it was about why ASEAN was formed, the different factors and motivations. And then now, it's about ASEAN's management of regional security, its um, approaches, and its effectiveness. So the two key questions are here. What were the security issues present? Remember, one of the things I asked you all to repeat over and over again in lecture, context, 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 context. We asked about what the context was like in 1967. Now I also want to deal with the context, the security context from uh, this first decade, 67 to 76. So what were the security issues present there? That's the first question. The second question is, is the main, the big one, which is how effective was ASEAN and its approaches in dealing with all these uh, security issues in the first decade? Right now we take things slow. We are just looking at the first decade, but subsequently we'll look at uh, all the way to the year 2000. Uh, some historical documents that I managed to dig up from the archives, uh, I think this one was one of the American archives, and I uh, just wanted to, to point out some, some things to you. You take a look. Although the impetus behind the formation of ASEAN was political, the goals set up by the five foreign ministers were economic. Now, uh, why did I pick this out in particular? It's because I thought that this was particularly useful if you want to do some sort of framing for your argument. You know, there are many different motivations as to why ASEAN was formed. Some could have been the trigger factors. In this case, they, they use the word impetus. So the impetus behind the formation was political. That means the immediate situation surrounding ASEAN, that, that was really the trigger factors and the push uh, for, for leaders to get that sense of urgency to form ASEAN. But the next line, the goals set up by the five foreign ministers were economic. So in this, in this line it says, uh, okay, while the impetus might have been political or security, the core motivations might have instead be with the economic reasons. So you can see a distinction here in terms of my relationship and in terms of my criteria. One of them is the impetus, the trigger factors, the immediate kind of um, situations. But they may not necessarily be the core motivations. Because the core motivations may have been more long-term, more structural, and more uh, uh, intimate to the agenda of the leaders. So that's something for you to think about. You can read the rest of the extract, but... Uh, I thought that this was a, a nice framing for um, your arguments as you construct them and as you think about the formation of ASEAN and its differing motivations and how they all relate to one another. Now, the first thing that I want to talk to you today is about uh, now that ASEAN has been formed in 1967, August, um, what does the organization look like? What are the challenges that it faced? Now, this issue of external interference. Why I, why I thought it would be a good idea to raise it up is because um, I want you to see that even though the founding members had consensus that they wanted to form this organization and they really did form the organization, that doesn't mean happily ever after. In fact, in the forming of the organization and in the wording of their declaration, um, there were many, many disagreements. 
and there was uh, a lot of uh, negotiation and compromise and so on and so forth. And one of the most contentious issues with the forming of ASEAN was about this issue of external interference. As I go on uh, to, to, to uh, develop further this, this particular contentious issue, you will see what it's all about. But um, I just want to highlight that it is not a happily ever after situation for ASEAN. In fact, um, even within the first decade, even at its founding and in, in its formation, there were many issues to iron out. And the issues revealed many strategic differences, many strategic divergences across the five founding members. They, I, I don't want you guys to make the mistake that they all thought the same way. They all thought the same way. It, it wasn't that case. Uh, there were many strategic differences and so on. So this is the issue of external interference. Now, this is from the ASEAN Declaration itself. Bangkok is something called the Bangkok Declaration. It's on 8 August 1967 at its founding. And you can see the bolder words over here. Um, in, in one of the clauses, it states, determined to ensure their stability and security from external interference in any form or manifestation. So you can see that external interference was a concern uh, for these five founding members but to varying degrees. And you can see the way that it's worded here is actually very vague. It's very general. Uh, there seems to be a, a general caution against external parties operating in the region, but there isn't really a very specific uh, target or there isn't a specific objective or there isn't a specific method or approach that ASEAN should adopt. So, um, right now, we can see that it is still very general and, and, and all that. Uh, and, but underlying this general statement, there were many strategic divergences and strategic differences that went about uh, the different uh, founding members. Now, for Indonesia, uh, Indonesia is one of the biggest proponents uh, of uh, guarding against external interference. Now, in the context of this time, when we say guard against external interference, it could mean one of two things. Number one, quite clearly, it refers to the Cold War and the fear of being used as proxy powers and all that kind of stuff by not just the superpowers, but also by the allies like uh, the UK and even China. Because remember, by this point in time, China is already communist. So uh, it, when you talk about external interference, it could refer to Cold War politics. The second thing that it could refer to would be uh, decal and the continuing presence of some former colonial, colonial powers in the region. Uh, to some countries, that would constitute as external interference as well. Now, one of the biggest proponents of guarding against external interference is Indonesia. Now, Indonesia, by now you should know what kind of character it has and so on and so forth. But Indonesia was always very concerned about larger powers operating in the region. Number one, I think that they, they feared that this would create a lot more instability. So from an altruistic point of view, this was their safeguarding of the region in terms of regional peace. But there is a more national interest point of view where Indonesia was always concerned about external interference because they feared that these larger powers might take away the leadership of the region from them. They will compete for leadership. So Indonesia was always wary about this kind of thing. Indonesia just had to look to the north of its borders to look at Singapore and Malaysia. And, and it saw that even though Singapore and Malaysia were fully independent by that point in time, they are fully independent countries. However, the British kept their military forces in both Singapore and Malaysia. And you see, that's what I mean by, by external interference in the, in the decolonization context. They were looking at continued former colonial powers presence in the region, um, especially with its military presence. So they saw something like this and, and they, they had very, very little tolerance for a situation like this. 
Indonesia is also the leader of the non-aligned movement. Now, the non-aligned movement, as its name suggests, is very, very closely linked to ex external interference and the prevention of that. So, as the leader of the non-aligned movement, they are moral bound and they are duty bound to make sure that uh, the, the region remains free from these kind of interference. Um, they are doing it in the non-aligned movement. They are one of the, the five leaders of the non-aligned movement. And now they are imposing these kind of cultures and this kind of standards upon uh, Southeast Asia as well. Now, I want you to, to take note of my phrasing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, to this point, I haven't used the word neutral. I haven't used the word neutrality. Now, non-alignment or the prevention of external interference, all those things, right, is not, it's not about neutrality. It's about the presence of Western nations or larger powers in the region. So this is not about making Southeast Asia neutral. This is about preventing Southeast Asia from being manipulated by larger powers, being used as proxies being continued to be controlled by former colonial powers. So this is not about neutrality. This is about external interference. Now, here comes the conflict. Now, Indonesia has all these kind of uh, uh, inclinations and all these kind of views on the continued Western presence in the region. But some of its uh, founding member partners in ASEAN did not necessarily share that point of view as well. I mean, you take a look at the Philippines, right? The Philippines, and we've been through this many times already, the Philippines are military allies of the US. Now, which means to say that there, are, there is definitely going to be a US military presence in the Philippines. And this is likely to continue given the Cold War situation. From the Philippine point of view, it is in their interest to keep the US there as well. Because... With the US there, not only do they have a defense backing, but there's also a lot of economic benefits that comes with a US military presence and a continued one at that. So uh, the picture you see here is between uh, uh, LBJ, Lyndon B. Johnson, the American president back then, and Ferdinand Marcos. So there is a very, very close relationship between the US and the Philippines. And of course, the Philippines is not going to turn its back on the US and say, hey, look, guys, leave, uh, get out of our country. I mean, there's no way that's ever going to happen. So, you know, points of disagreement. Like, Suharto, he's saying, like, and cool animation graphics over here, uh, the Americans need to go. And especially, you know, their superpower and all that kind of stuff, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, proxy status and all that kind of reputation will come in. Suharto is saying, no, bro, like, the Americans need to go. And Marcos is like, no, dude, uh, that's, that's never, ever going to happen. So, you know, okay, thanks, love you, bye. And, and that became kind of a point of contention between leaders like that. I'll just give you an idea of, of why Marcos would be so quick to say no um, and, and, and to reject, you know, whatever prompts the Indonesians are saying about, hey, get, let's get the Western powers out of this. You take a look at the American presence in the Philippines. Like, this is just one naval base in the Philippines that is housed by the American naval forces. Although it's the biggest one, uh, this, this, bay, this uh, base called Subic Bay Naval Base. But you can see, it is massive. And I want you to take a look very closely here at the ship that is there. It is an aircraft carrier. Now, uh, not all ports have aircraft carrier facilities. Now, if a port has aircraft carrier facilities, means that port is really, really strategically super important. And there's no way the Americans or the Filipinos are going to say goodbye to these kind of things. Look at the, the you know, the whole, um, the whole town of Subic, right, was born because of the American naval base over there. Like a whole town emerged because of this naval base. There's immense economic value. Oh, let me show you. Yeah, look, look at the town behind there. Like it's immense economic value uh, that the Americans are giving to the Philippines over there. Uh, more um, uh, photos here. You can see there's an airstrip, so they have air aircraft facilities in this naval base as well. They have another um, uh, na uh, airfield in Clark, this, this place called Clark Air Base in, in the Philippines. You can see it's massive and it's a purely military uh, base. 
uh, you know, uh, American fighter jets are all there and so on and so forth. So, we take a look at the map and we ask ourselves, uh, you know, why is Philippines so strategically important for the US? You take a look at the map over here, Philippines is in green and uh, Vietnam is in orange. As you know, at this point in time, the Vietnam War is going on and all that. So, Americans, they, they, America is not near Southeast Asia. Like you take a flight to America and you know how long it is. But America is not near Southeast Asia. So they need what we call a forward deployment base. A forward deployment base basically means that the Americans can situate their troops in a foreign country. This foreign country is independent, but they can situate their troops in a foreign country and they can maneuver these troops to any active conflict that is nearby. In this case, it's the Vietnam War. So rather than send their planes from, the, uh, uh, from, from USA itself, what they can do in a Vietnam War situation, if they need to, they can deploy their forces from the Philippines to attack Vietnam or to defend like whatever. So it's, it's much closer. Lah. This is about geographical proximity and geopolitics. So this relationship is really, really important and there is no way that any of them are going to give up this relationship. Now, the same thing uh, is, is a parallel. The same thing can be drawn with Thailand as well. Now, Thailand, like the Philippines, is a military ally of, uh, is a military ally of um, uh, the US. And for Thailand, it is even more uh, important because Thailand, as I mentioned in tutorials, is what we call a frontline state. Just now when I talk about Philippines, right, it, I told you about how close it is to Vietnam. Now, Thailand is even closer to Vietnam. And the Americans, in their strategic planning, they see Thailand as the center of all their uh, campaigns against Vietnam. So Thailand is what they call the center, and the center must hold. We need to say that if Thailand falls to communism, the whole of Southeast Asia in their projections will fall to communism as well. So Thailand is that one linchpin, that one primary location where it cannot be allowed to be overrun by the communists. So Thailand, you know, on, from their point of view, they also have huge incentive to keep the Americans there, quite similar to what I said about the Philippines as well. And you can see that their bases, also not small, they're quite big and all that kind of stuff, uh, housing huge numbers of American uh, assets, military assets. One in particular, you might be familiar with this one, it's called the Dong Myung Air Base. Now, if you fly to Bangkok, Dong Myung is a, is, a, is a commercial airport. So when you fly to Bangkok, you can fly into Dong Myung or Suvarnabhumi Airport. But uh, Dong Myung used to be an uh, American uh, military airbase. And now it kind of looks something like this. And I just want to point out that uh, a lot of today's airports, the commercial airports, were once upon a time uh, military bases. And the black and white picture that you see over here, if you can guess, and you probably have guessed it out, uh, is Changi Airport actually. So Changi Airport, together with some other airports in Singapore like Pai Leba and Selita, they were all air bases for the British. And you know, as time went on, we developed them into commercial airports and so on and so forth. So a lot of colonial legacies in the infrastructure you can see. So same thing, if you look at the map, uh, the, the forward deployment idea applies to Thailand as well. What, what I mean by that is that, uh, uh, as I said, Thailand you can see is right smack in the center of every shit on earth. So uh, the troops that are housed there have a quicker deployment time. Uh, they can reach Vietnam or, or any of the, of the other surrounding countries. So yeah, um, this, looks, this looks like the map and this is about geopolitics. I think it was your batch, and I, I, I still laugh about it, like, till today. But there's one base called Yutapau, and I think we had that one lecture where I, I just completely missed out this, this, this name and the significance of it, and, and you guys were going about uh, Yutapau, Yutapau. Yeah, anyway, so the Yutapau base is in Thailand. So, same thing. Suato goes, like, hey, look, Thais, no external interference and all that. And Tanom, he's looking at the situation, and he's assessing, and he's saying, yeah, no, bro. 
Or in this case, you'll say, no crap, goodbye. That was a bad Thai accent. Um, it's, a, it's a really telling picture that you see over here. The kind of politics that Southeast Asia is, is engaged with right now. You can see that both of them are military leaders by trade la, and by occupation. And, but these are both, you know, one is a president, the other one is a prime minister. Uh, but they, 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 are, they are having very different strategic views on the role of external interference in the region. Now, Singapore and Malaysia as well. Uh, Singapore and Malaysia actually even more so. They, they, they can't let go of the British, uh, the British military forces. Because Singapore and Malaysia, you must remember, they are new nations. In fact, they are the newest nations uh, by this point in time. And they really have no defence force to speak of. They have no local defence force. There is no NS, there's no whatever, whatever, those kind of stuff. So they, at this point in time, they rely on the British, the Australians, the New Zealanders, the Commonwealth for uh, their defence. So they really have nothing to fall back on, which makes their situation even more precarious and which <laughs> makes them even more unwilling to let go of this idea of external powers in the region. Um, so they signed a few treaties, the Anglo-Malayan Defence Agreement, the Five Power. The FPDA actually is still in effect till today. The Five Powers are uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Britain, Australia and New Zealand. So this arrangement, the Five Power Defence Arrangement, still lasts till today. This is a military alliance. Uh, this is not like some like talk of sing song kind of thing. It's a military alliance uh, within this Five Power. So kind of like they're duty-bound to defend each other and shit like that. Singapore is a small country, but our naval base has immense importance. The naval base that I'm talking about is the Sembawang one, and it's an immense, uh, complex facility. It has the ability to house warships and all. Not aircraft carriers, I think, at this point in time, but they can house warships and all that kind of stuff for the British and its allies. You can see it's quite big and all that kind of stuff. In Malaysia, you have airfields as well to house the British troops uh, and all that kind of stuff. So the British, because of Cold War politics back in Europe, they are also kind of like duty-bound to the Americans to do their best to prevent Southeast Asia from falling to communism and the dominoes and all that kind of stuff. So the British also do pay some level of cost to remain in Southeast Asia, especially with Singapore and Malaysia. Um, but this has been some kind of uh, contention uh, among our five ASEAN members. So you can see, once again, Suato is saying, you know, I don't care, you know, you don't have national armies. And in fact, he might be saying something like, Indonesia will take care of all of your, I wouldn't put it past him. Although I don't know if he actually did, did say that. Uh, and then Lee Kuan Yew and, and Tengku are like, you know, <laughs> dude, this is never going to happen. Um, the British have to remain in 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 terms of our national survival and, and our defence and all that kind of stuff. So we have the conflict here set up. Indonesia is adamant about its stance that no, there should not be uh, external interference in the region in any form. Um, anyone a, a, as well, with regards to superpowers or great powers or even communist China, you know, it shouldn't happen. Uh, the con this kind of presence should be eliminated. But the other four nations, Thailand, Philippines, Singapore, and Malaysia, none of them were willing to concede on this point. And uh, Singapore actually had an additional fear, and they feared exactly what Indonesia's ambition was, which was regional leadership. And Singapore did not want that situation where the region would come under the dominance of Indonesia. So Singapore had all those kind of fears at that point in time as well. So, guys, uh, there's a conflict. You can see that not, it's not a happily ever after situation. Uh, and even in the wording of the Bangkok Declaration, you know, when they come together and they, they talk things out, they, they still want to push through this organization, but they have to concede and they have to compromise on certain things and blah, blah, blah. So the exact wording in the Bangkok Declaration, the founding declaration, that's now you saw it, now you see it again at a different part, it says, affirming that all foreign bases are temporary. Now, once again, let's draw a connection to the earlier part of it you saw. The phrasing is very, very vague. What does temporary mean? There is no exact timeline. There is no 
uh, concrete plan, there are no stipulations, there are no obligations, and so on and so forth. And it's left deliberately like this as a general clause, and you might say it is a, it is a vague clause. Now, is this necessarily a bad thing? Or is this a product of the circumstance? Or is this a compromise that is acceptable at this point in time? So these are things that you have to think about. Um, with regards to, especially, how ASEAN works. Now, one of the biggest criticisms about ASEAN is that there is nothing concrete that comes out of ASEAN. And whatever ASEAN does is either very slow or very insignificant. Now, I, I, I think that, that is a criticism that is valid uh, to some degree. But I'd like to challenge you guys, and I, I put this challenge out to, to, to every cohort, um, which is that I, I feel that it's a much easier task to criticize ASEAN. And, and so be it, because there is proper evidence for that. You can criticize ASEAN, but it is a much harder and tougher task to understand ASEAN and to contextualize ASEAN and to understand what its objectives are and then to credit them or to understand them based on that. I'm not asking you to praise ASEAN blindly, but I'm asking you to look at the context at which ASEAN is in, the member states are in, and then asking you to look at their objectives, look at their mandate, what they set out to do, and then judge them for that. Because if you impose your own standards when you criticize ASEAN, that's a bit unfair. Because we are not looking at what ASEAN set out to do. So the only proper way to judge ASEAN and its effectiveness is to go back to its objectives, look at its mandate, and then judge their effectiveness based on that. If, by their own objectives and their mandate, they are ineffective by your assessment, then okay, so be it. But we have been through a sound argumentation process. But if we look at their objectives and we see that there is some small successes here and there, some marginal gain here and there, and even though it might not be massive or significant or whatever, but we can still credit ASEAN based on that. So this is the framework, the mindset that I want you to have as you look at ASEAN's effectiveness. Don't be too quick to judge. Make sure that you have a sound process and criteria for judging ASEAN's effectiveness. And one of the biggest things about ASEAN and the way they work is their philosophy, their approach, and affectionately known as the ASEAN way principles. In fact, the anthem that I so gloriously sang to you just now was called the ASEAN Way, the anthem. Now, the ASEAN Way principles, like guys, this is the most important part of ASEAN. Uh, as I teach you about ASEAN, this probably is one of the most important slides that you must really, really understand and you really have to like, remember their principles and their uh, approaches. Why? Because in any ASEAN SBQ that you are given, any topic about ASEAN, except for, for its formation, but any topic about ASEAN, you can use the ASEAN Way principles as CK. Pretty soon I'll teach you how to do all that, but to do that, you must have a good understanding of the ASEAN Way principles. Now, number one, mutual respect for sovereignty and uh, territorial integrity. What this means basically is that we must respect the independence of nations. Why is this so important? It links to the decal context. Most of uh, these five founding members have just been recently decolonized. So independence is a really, really important element to them. And this one is no compromise, uh, no, a no compromise situation. Number two, non-use of force um, no military pacts within ASEAN, uh, and there's a preference for diplomacy and a peaceful settlement of disputes. Now, ASEAN, once again, is not set up as a military organization. It is not set up as a defense organization. So its main weapon, its main tool, cannot be military force, cannot be the use of enforcement mechanisms. Instead, what ASEAN, what ASEAN's main weapon is, or what ASEAN's main tool is, is diplomacy. 
And I know diplomacy is like, you know, soft skills and soft power and all that kind of stuff, but don't ever under underestimate the power of diplomacy because uh, with the power of words and persuasion and rhetoric and all that, you can actually achieve a lot of things. And the way that ASEAN does things is through diplomacy. That's their first option. Uh, the third one is um, a, a really important principle as well, is this principle called non-interference. Now, each member state, as they came together, they pledged that they would not interfere in the domestic affairs of each country. Remember, I told you guys that each of these countries right now have a different political system. Some of them are military, military regimes, some of them are authoritarian rule, some of them are democracy. But coming together, they cannot comment on each other's way of governance. That's their own domestic political issues. Coming together, the agenda is for cooperation on different fields and it should remain as such. So this idea of non-interference is that you cannot ever criticize or comment on a fellow member's domestic issues because this, if you do so, it might look like you're interfering in their affairs. And non-interference is so powerful because non-interference gives this guarantee to any nation that joins ASEAN that they would have um, this guarantee that their domestic affairs would be safeguarded. The forum of ASEAN is not meant to discuss those kind of things. So, you see, it gives them the incentive and it gives them the, the, the incentive to, to bind together and to keep together. You know, one of the big things, the big questions that we have is, despite all the challenges that ASEAN faced and all the differences that ASEAN faced, how come it managed to keep together and how come it managed to grow and prosper to what it is today? And one of the, the, the big things to look at is how it conducted its diplomacy, what kind of principles, values did it set for its organization. And the last one is uh, this, the two C's, consultation and consensus. That's the way they do things. You organize dialogue platforms, that's the consensus, and then you try to achieve some sort of consensus on a way to move forward. You can see the Malay terms over here, their Bahasa, Indonesia, uh, and you can see the Indonesian influence in ASEAN that it sets uh, the very approaches on which ASEAN is founded upon. So ASEAN Way principles uh, do get a good knowledge and understanding of them as we go forward as well. So I'm not going to go into the, the disputes itself. You guys know about it already. Now, Sabah dispute is the, one of the most immediate things that ASEAN has to deal with. And I want you to see that uh, at this point in time, Marcos is the president of the Philippines and he recognized the formation of Malaysia in 1966 and uh, in the interest of ASEAN and regional solidarity. So what this means is that... Um, uh, even though there was some disagreement and there was some opposition from Philippines at the start with regards to the formation of Malaysia, by the time Marcos takes power in 1965, he tries to soothe over this relationship with Malaysia and he tries to form a relationship with Malaysia and you know, kind of like not touch too much about these uh, very touchy affairs. So there's a tacit agreement by both countries, Malaysia and Philippines, uh, that the Sabah dispute would be tabled at an ASEAN platform of mediation. Now, this is quite crucial because we can get, an, we can get a sense of how the leaders saw ASEAN at that point in time, what its functions were. And at that point in time, in theory at least, the leaders committed to talking about the Sabah issue at an ASEAN platform. Um, what this means is that uh, ASEAN, as, as what the leaders saw then, could be served as this mediatory um, platform for leaders who are, or countries who are in conflict to come together to discuss and to talk about things rather than to escalate tensions. So this gives you a, an idea and an understanding of some of ASEAN's functions and its character at this point in time. However, even though the intent was there, um, 
uh, it, it, the, the Sabah dispute at that point in time was really never tabled at any ASEAN platform or whatever. It was never really discussed. And um, if, if there was that rare chance where it was tabled, it, it, there wouldn't be much headway in the discussion. So it was pretty much a stalemate and that kind of stuff. More crucially, you can see the fourth point here, the Corridor Affair in 1968. We can see that at this point in time, while there are surface overtures, there are surface kind of uh, uh, public displays of, let's say, uh, of diplomacy. However, you, we know from Marcos that he was, he was planning this secret operation on Sabah and all that kind of stuff. So we can see that ASEAN at this point in time isn't, doesn't have that kind of influence, doesn't have that kind of uh, clout to, to, to really shape the behaviour of the, the member states. Because member states, you can see here, are still pretty much engaged in their unilateral action. And they are not resolving issues that they have with each other through diplomacy. You can see here, it's about uh, some sort of military action against uh, Malaysia. And then Malaysia in turn also counters with their own military uh, action. And so we can see that ASEAN at this point in time doesn't have a real, real firm grabs on their lead, the, the member states and how they behave towards one another and all that kind of stuff. But okay, let's contextualize it a bit. This is one year after ASEAN's formation. Does it have the power, the influence, the clout to do these kind of things to their member states to shape their behavior and all that kind of stuff? Perhaps not. I mean, it's only been one year and all that. So, I mean, this is what we mean by trying to contextualize things and, and all that. Because as we go on later into the time frame with Sabah conflict and all that, I've given you a whole like, list of evidence here. With later leaders and as time passed, we can see that ASEAN as a platform was being used more and more. Diplomatically speaking, the ASEAN platform was used more and more and uh, we can see that there are positive outcomes that are coming out from ASEAN when the leaders uh, come together to talk about their issues. So um, the mediatory function that ASEAN have, mediating between nations, it was there at the beginning and perhaps not so effective at the start. But this identity and this characteristic and this function remained throughout the decades and it got better and better across time. So that is one of the change and continuity that we want to track and we want to see about ASEAN's effectiveness. It could serve as a frame of your argument as well, where maybe in the short term, there were huge problems with its effectiveness. But across time, there was increasing effectiveness seen across a variety of issues. It could be something like that, depending on the sources and what you see. So, another thing that I want you guys to understand is that because ASEAN is not a military organization, uh, when it deals with security, it has to deal with it in very innovative, very creative methods. Now, this innovative and creative methods is what we call the comprehensive strategy of ASEAN in dealing with security issues. Because ASEAN can't send in troops and all that kind of stuff, they have to find alternative means in order to ensure security. So the end goal is still peace in the region and security in the region, but they have to find alternative methods. And a lot of these alternative methods are things to do with the economy things to do with forming social cooperation. Even things like, like seemingly useless kind of stuff like sea games and all that. Actually, it serves as a, what we call a social glue to bind the nations together and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so, hopefully, with stronger ties and stronger political relationships, it would also address the security issues in the region. It will also ensure sustainable peace. So ASEAN has limited capacity for military, but it can also play a security role through other methods and approaches. A lot of it comes down to ASEAN Way principles as well. So the next conflict is about confrontasi. Again, I don't really want to go through it. You guys know what it's about. Um, I want you to take a look at... Um, uh, Suhato, the figure of Suhato, obviously his agenda is now to repair the relationships 
uh, between the, the, the nations and all that kind of stuff. Um, and and uh, what he, he wants to use ASEAN is, is that this platform to showcase that Indonesia uh, is showing goodwill towards its neighbours. A sharp departure from what it was like before, now Indonesia is a good neighbour, is the big like abang, the big brother, and they're going to like embrace each other and take care of each other and like got your back, you know, that kind of stuff. So that's what the motivation for ASEAN is from the Indonesia point of view. And again, we can see what kind of uh, functions the leaders saw ASEAN as having. A lot of it comes down to mediation. A lot of it comes down to establishing closer ties, political ties between the leaders. Um, and with uh, Singapore as well, especially, I mean, they want to repair the relationship and all that kind of stuff. Um, it also wants to, I mean, not everything is altruistic. La. I mean, Indonesia, for, for all you want to say that they have goodwill, they want to show goodwill to the nations, a lot of these kind of things are strategic geopolitical calculations as well. Uh, specifically for Indonesia, they have a very specific fear of China. Um, China, two fears. La. The first fear is of communist China, the communist element and creating instability in the region because of the communist factor. The second fear is that they always fear that China wants to assume leadership in the region. So that would wrest the leadership title away from them. So they're always very cautious uh, towards China. And ASEAN is another way for them to build up relationships with Southeast Asian nations so that it removes them from the sphere of uh, Chinese influence. And last one we talk about is, is Thailand. Um, the, and Thailand is, is one of those countries where right now it's not really involved in any large interstate conflicts except for, for its proximity uh, towards the Vietnam War. So at this early point in time, as I mentioned, Tanak Koman, he is a very important figure in putting ASEAN together. And he's, it is a result of, a big part is a result of his diplomacy that manages to tie everyone together and keep the organization intact at this early phase. Now, the big one, the big conflict that is happening right now is the Vietnam War. And again, I don't really want to go into it because I'm, I'm sure you guys know like, what's happening and stuff. Take a look at this quote over here. Uh, and I'm looking at ASEAN's relationship to the Vietnam War. ASEAN refused to present itself as a security bloc because it wished to avoid the polarizing effects of such a position on other states of the region. Now, um, in, in coded terms, what this line is saying is that ASEAN has to be very careful about how it presents itself. Uh, because ASEAN is a public organization and, and people are going to have perceptions and people are going to form impressions of what ASEAN is about. Now, ASEAN at this stage is very, very careful not to present themselves as a security organization, as a defense organization, as a military organization. They are also very, very careful not to identify any specific threat. Even Vietnam doesn't appear anywhere in their documents at this stage. Now, why are they so careful to, to, to shape their presentation and to shape their appearance? It's because any wrong move on their part could provoke Vietnam. And it could provoke the, 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 the communists in Vietnam. And if it escalates further, it could provoke the communists in China. It could provoke the communists in the Soviet Union. And you know, pretty soon, it'll escalate into something much larger. Because... You, 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 you situate yourself in 1967 and you are a Soviet, okay, you are Russian and you are a Chinese and you are looking, and you are Vietnamese, you are looking into Southeast Asia and suddenly you see this block of five countries coming together. I mean, you start to get a bit worried, right? Like, oh, what, what is this five countries all about? And suddenly, like, one of the five countries, the member states, they say that, oh, like, they, they use the word military or they use the word defense or they use the word whatever that connotates that this is a military alliance you would jump uh, in your seat and you'd be like, holy shit, what? And then you would start to form strategies to counter this military organization and it's going to lead to an escalation. So ASEAN is very careful not to, to, to engage in that kind of uh, situation. 
So it presents itself as an organization primarily concerned with regional cooperation, regional, the regional economy, developing the nations, all that kind of non-security related stuff. Because it does not want to provoke Vietnam uh, and possibly China and the Soviets as well. No mention was made of political cooperation, let alone security. ASEAN elites expressly and repeatedly denied that ASEAN was a security organization or alliance. Um, there are some defense cooperations going on right now among ASEAN members. Like just now I mentioned the five power defense arrangement. Singapore and Malaysia are part of that. Uh, but they are not part of ASEAN. Those are bilateral or multilateral arrangements that exist outside of ASEAN. So whenever you know, someone criticizes them and points out these kind of things, ASEAN will quickly say that, hey, look, this isn't under ASEAN. This is something that the nations themselves went to arrange and so on and so forth. That's their own Tai Chi. So again, the image, the public image is, is very important at this stage and, and ASEAN kind of like is very, very guarded against those kind of things. So when it conducts its relations against North Vietnam and the communists there, it is very, very careful. Um, they present themselves as an organization formed of non-communist states. Now, take note of my phrasing here, non-communist. I didn't say anti-communist. So the, the five founding members, I mean, we all know lah, they are anti-communist, but in their public presentation of ASEAN, they word it as a collection of non-communist states. You can see that their, their strategic planning is, is quite well done because they are keeping Vietnam very much at the forefront of their minds. What kind of words they say can potentially trigger an escalating situation and all that kind of stuff. So actually, ASEAN does make quite a lot of constructive effort. They do have a lot of agency in conversing with North Vietnam. Um, nothing consequential comes out of it, nothing significant comes out of it at this point in time, but you can see the attempt, and you can see their function. Their function as trying to manage regional security and trying to enforce, or not enforce, right, trying to ensure some kind of peace, some level of peace in the region. Now, things start to change. Now, ASEAN in 1967 was um, a bit, you know, uh, cautious about their approach to security and all that, and they didn't want to give the wrong impression and all that. But there are certain developments in the region that happen. And um, I'll, I'll go through some of the developments in the region, but the, the main point as we go through these developments is to see that um, there are big changes in the political landscape of the region and it prompts ASEAN to think deeper and to think harder about their security role and what kind of function they play, what kind of things they can do for the security of the region. The first one that starts to change is that the British, they are actually running out of money uh, back home and they are unable to maintain their military force across uh, the world. So for Singapore and Malaya, the British decide to withdraw um, their troops, which means to say that Singapore and Malaysia now are essentially going to lose that British defence umbrella. And this prompts a lot of security anxiety, and it also removes a sizable economic contribution from the British. Um, and you can see that it shakes up a lot of things. There is a vacuum of power. Uh, we, and so you can see Rajaranam here, the, towards the end he says, we can and should fill it in ourselves, not necessarily militarily, but by strengthening our social, economic, and political foundations. Remember I talked to you all just now about the comprehensive approach of ASEAN to deal with security matters. We can see it over here. Nothing mentioned about defense or security or, or whatever. Strengthening our social, economic, and political foundations. So we can start to see that ASEAN is getting a bit more assertive 
in taking up a security role in the region because of certain changes in the political landscape of the region. Further changes. The US is not doing well in Vietnam, the Vietnam War. Back home, there are anti-war protests and so on and so forth. Uh, Nixon, he releases this thing called the Guam Doctrine. It is a signal of further American intent to dislodge from direct intervention. In short terms, this means that they are planning their exit strategy. They are planning to remove their troops. Uh, they will continue to serve some sort of deterrent effect, but in terms of active troops on the ground, they are planning to remove it. Uh, and their idea is that the Vietnam War should be handled by the South Vietnamese. They can provide training, but the fighting should be done by the South Vietnamese. Now, just now we talked about the British leaving. Now the Americans are leaving as well. There's some vacuum of power that is happening in terms of the security landscape. The Western powers are leaving. And for all that some people are celebrating about that, it leaves many, many question marks and it leaves a lot of vulnerability um, in the security landscape. ASEAN is taking very close look at all these movements from the larger powers. At the same time, you know, the Vietnam War is, is escalating. More crucially, the North, they are gaining ground. They are moving down to the central regions of Vietnam at this point in time. There's a lot of heavy fighting there, but they are pushing through and they are making their way south. The war has even escalated to the neighboring states of Cambodia and Laos, um, where the communists are making like alternative routes to make it down to Saigon where the American concentration of forces are at. So you can see that regionally speaking, uh, is getting more and more unstable. Even in the communist world, there's a lot of instability. Right now, the world is waking up to the fact that the communist bloc, China and the Soviets, they may not be as harmonious as the world once thought they were. In fact, there are a lot of disagreements. And finally, there's a Sino-Soviet split. Um, and you don't need to know too much about this, but basically it has further implications on the security landscape of Southeast Asia, especially to do uh, with the Vietnam War. So um, in a sense, uh, this also further complicates the situation in Vietnam and leads to more instability as well. So you can see uh, the map over here, the Soviet Union and China, they're quite close to the region and whatever kind of politics they have between them would affect uh, Southeast Asia as well, uh, especially to do with the Vietnam War. So let me consolidate some of the four, I mean, the, uh, let me consolidate the four things that are happening. Number one, the British, they're yeah, in cool animation graphics again, uh, took a long time to, to, to do this. Uh, the British are leaving. Uh, militarily speaking, they are, they are removing their military assets from Southeast Asia. Um, the communists are gaining ground. They are moving to the central regions of Vietnam and it looks like they are doing well in their campaigns. Nixon basically looks at the situation and sees that the situation is unsustainable for the US, both because of the strength of the communists as well as the anti-war protests back at home. So he's saying, yeah, okay, he's shaking. He's like, oh my God, screw you, you know, screw you guys. Uh, we need to plan for our exit strategy from Southeast Asia. The brave Americans, the courageous Americans, they need to plan for an exit strategy. And then there's the Sino-Soviet split. They are bickering against one another and that has implications for Southeast Asia as well. Now, the first document that emerges from ASEAN that has specifically to do with the security landscape is this document called Zotfan. Zotfan stands for Zone of Peace, Freedom and Neutrality. Uh, it, is, it is something to, to govern or to look at the, region, the region's uh, security landscape. Um, as the name suggests, you can see Zone of Peace, Freedom and Neutrality. Um, the fourth point here is the important part. Commitment to build regional resilience free from external interference. Again, the idea here is to make to prevent Southeast Asia from being a proxy zone. is to prevent Southeast Asia from being used and manipulated by larger powers for their own political interests. So you can see here that 
the resilience is the key. It's not so much to say, kick everyone out. It's not so much to say, let's kick the Western powers out and all that kind of stuff. It's more inward looking. It's, it's more about building the resilience of ASEAN and Southeast Asia so that we never have to fall to the manipulation of larger powers or we never have to be kind of like excessively dependent upon them and that they don't have to interfere in our politics. Uh, with regards to Zotfan, uh, it, is a, it is a milestone for ASEAN security management in the region and I'll go deeper into this in tutorials. But this is the first attempt uh, to, to communicate the idea that ASEAN is going to take a larger role in managing the security of the region and uh, they, are, they, are, they are trying to build up the resilience of the region against external interference. However, the situation continues to deteriorate in a sense that the communists are gaining huge ground and in fact by 1973-1975 uh, the Vietnam War has reached its conclusion with the communist forces as triumphant. So this is a major, 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 major point in Southeast Asian politics because not only do we now have a fully unified and independent communist country in Southeast Asia and a strong one at that, but it also signals the end of the American presence, uh, the American military presence in Southeast Asia. So there's huge, huge vacuums of power created and there's a huge security threat perception because of uh, the strength of communism emanating from Vietnam. So this prompts two other documents that come out. Number one, the ASEAN Concord, and number two, the Treaty of Amnity and Cooperation. Amnity is, is, is basically another word for friendship. So you can see that concord, amnity, cooperation, these are still non-military terms, but they are all created to try to manage the security of the region. And a lot of the management of the security of the region, once again, is not done by military force, but is done by a lot of non-military elements. You can see cooperation on basic commodities, cooperation on large-scale industrial projects, con Cooperation in trade, uh, economic problems. You can encourage military cooperation, but not within the organization of ASEAN. It is outside, but ASEAN can encourage that kind of stuff as well. Promote perpetual peace, everlasting unity, and cooperation among the peoples which should contribute to their strength, solidarity, and closer relationship. You can see up to this point, 10 years down the road from ASEAN's formation, the documents are all still worded pretty vaguely. But at the same time, we can see some measure of change already because with Zotfan and then with TAC and the ASEAN Concord, we can see that ASEAN is taking small steps towards assuming a greater security role in the region. Again, not that they are a military alliance, but they are taking more active interest in trying to manage the security of the region and to create some sort of uh, governing structure for the Southeast Asian nations. So we can see some measure of change there. Now, at the end of the day, when we assess ASEAN in the first decade and all that, honestly, can we say that they are hugely effective in managing the, the conflicts and all that? From the evidence, it seems like maybe not so. I mean, there are some small successes here and there, definitely, and they are making strides, like Zotfan, TAC, Concord. They are, they are making all these kind of strides, but perhaps it is, it is too early in their developmental phase. Uh, you know, 10 years, in 10 years their, their first 10 years, it, maybe it's a bit too early to declare them a success. Um, so at this stage, I, I think that, that even though it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's still up for debate, but perhaps it is too early to judge them and to declare them a success in terms of their security management. But at least through this lecture, you can see what the security landscape was like, the challenges that ASEAN faced, the beginnings of its uh, security identity. And, and how it tried to manage the region's security issues. And lastly, you know, how effective it was. So this will be uh, the start of our ASEAN and regional security lectures. Uh, hopefully you got a good foundation from this. And um, if you, you know, uh, 
don't then just rewatch the whole thing and listen to my sweet voice once again. So, thanks guys, and uh, I'll see you next time on whatever FM this is with DJ Anesh. It's been great. I hope you guys enjoy it, and uh, I'll see you guys real soon.